exercise 2.3 is about um, images and how we represent them. In the lecture, we learned that uh, continuous image or discrete images are always these types of mappings. Mappings from a domain to a color space. And now we uh, are just warming up a little bit in order to see um, if we can apply this um, mathematical framework to one example image that we have here. So maybe I zoom in a little bit so you can see what the image properties say here. So we are given this image of a monkey and on the right hand side, well, it may look different on your computer, but we also have the image properties. So we see width height is 512 pixels. And the question now um, would be um, for you to decide whether this image is discrete or continuous and specify a suitable domain and color space. So what do you think? So given the image mandrill, What is omega for this image and what could be the color space? You can either answer in the chat or um, with your microphone, whatever you prefer. Okay, so um, we have a RGB color space here and we have 512 times 512 uh, pixels. Yeah. So this is still very um, informal, but it will help us to um, make it a little bit more, um, more precise what we, what we mean with a 512 by 512 pixels. Because what we need here on the left and on the right is uh, we need a set. So omega and f are sets and now we are going to specify those sets mathematically. So we really want to know um, which, which set we mean when we, when we talk about omega. And we have one answer in the chat that precisely tells us that omega should be uh, just the numbers from 1 to 512 times once again the numbers from 1 to 512. So in the end uh, what we have here is a Cartesian product. And we can also write it like this, that it consists of indices or tuples, yeah, tuples with two entries, i and j, such that i and j uh, are numbers between 1 and 512. And this will, us allow, uh, will allow us to address each pixel uh, in a unique way. So F, the color space, the RGB color space. So um, we also have a correct answer here uh, in the chat. And um, so we also need to know what, what colors is our, um, uh, is, is, of what colors is our set made up or what, how can we specify those colors? And we also specify it by using numbers. And one example would be to use the numbers from zero to 255 and then to the three. Yeah, so this means we have uh, once again tuples, we call them R, G and B. So now we have three entries and R, G and B are numbers between zero and 255. All right. So we can also um, do something like this uh, using um, MATLAB or Octave, depending on what you have installed on your machine. 
So let's uh, read in the image. And then what we can do, for example, is we can take a look at the size of the image. And it will tell us exactly what we, what we have here in some sense on the right hand side. We will see it's a 512 by 512 image. And it also has a, a third dimension that is made up of three layers that can tell us something like, well, this image is made out of the three colors. So we can take a look also at this image. And we see, okay, it's the monkey that we just had on our exercise sheet. So you find this image also in the homework material for this week. So, and now about the type. So we can, for example, just look at one of the image entries. Let's take, for example, a look at the first image entry and we see, okay, it's a number, 166. But how do we know um, so what is what is the largest number or not? So for this, for example, we can uh, use something like type info. If you use uh, the MATLAB or Octave GUI, you will also have in the variable editor the, the type of your of your variable A. And um, in our case, it says it's a uint8 matrix. So uint8 means numbers from 0 to 100. 255. So we can also say, well, this is u int 8. Okay. So far for the warm up, let's take a look at another example. So now it's getting a little bit more abstract. We are now considering a three by three matrix. And now the question would be the same. So for this matrix, what would be a suitable um, domain and what would be a good color space? You can once again answer via microphone or via the chat. Okay, so we have a three by three matrix. That looks good. So in the end, we can say, well, before we had a 512 by 512 matrix, and now it's three by three matrix. So omega should be the indices from one to three to the two. And we have also another answer for the color space. And um, so, for example, one could, could choose, um, so now uh, we, we, one could choose different color spaces here because we do not know what is the, uh, the maximal number um, that we are considering in our color space F. But looking at this image, one could say, say well, based on the previous example uh, where we had a, a color image that was made up of three layers of U and 8, matrices, one could say, well, this is once again u and 8 because we have zeros and the largest number is 255. So we could just go from 0 to 255. But one could also say, well, in, in the end, we only have three different colors in our image. So we could also say, so alternatively, we can, could just say, well, our color space is just 0, 127 and 255. So mathematically, this is not a problem. So we just have an image that is made out of, of black, gray, and white. This would work, but on the computer, you know that we are limited um, to certain data types. So uh, in the end, one could, um, one will always come up with uh, with a set like this. So maybe we only have 16 different colors or 32, um, but we won't have something like this on the computer usually. But of course, mathematically this works and it would also be fine to use a color space like this.
So looking at this matrix, what we can see is a very nice um, visualization of the mapping itself. Because in here, we have the image of the index tuple 1, 1. It gets mapped to this upper left corner of the matrix. The lower right corner is just the image, one could say u of 3, 3 is 255. So just like you would address entries of a matrix, you have here in this matrix encoded already this whole function with domain, with color space, and also with the, the mapping itself that tells you how to map elements of your domain, so tuples, to color values. Okay, so now we have a matrix, now we want to draw an image on a piece of paper or in my case uh, on this virtual paper here on the right hand side. So how would we do this? So we have a domain that is three by three. So let me, uh, oh, let me just draw. So this is our domain. I make my three pixels in here. Also three pixels in this direction. Okay, so, and now um, we would say, um, well, zero is black, so we would color this one here completely black, also this one and this one. Then we would have a gray part in here on this diagonal part. And these three pixels here would be white. So this would be a, a more visual representation of the image. So making it clear where each pixel starts and ends. So I always, I also tried to make the boundaries of the pixels like, um, yeah, like one would imagine them if one looks at a grid. Yeah, every every pixel also has a boundary here. So I think. There are no questions with respect to the visualization of this. And this is, of course, how it works for every grayscale image in this case. Yeah, you always have a matrix of values, but once you tell it to, to be interpreted as an image, well, then it gets colored like this. So now it gets um, more interesting. We now want to expand our drawing by a Cartesian XY coordinate system. So and now it's important that we remember how we address our pixels in here. In particular, if you look here at the left-hand side, this center of this pixel, yeah, if we address this as a whole, we would say uh, it has the coordinates 1, 1 in terms of omega of our indices. So if we take this pixel down here, it has the coordinates 2, 1, uh, because the first index of a matrix always gives us the row of the matrix, and the second index always gives us the column. So I think this is rather trivial if we stay in the matrix world. But once we want to interpret these tuples as elements of a two-dimensional space. So they are all are also in R2, and we want to add um, coordinate, a coordinate system around it. We will see that it, it may look different from the usual way that we draw coordinate systems. So do you do you have an idea of, on what, what I'm getting at? So where, where should the coordinate lines of our XY coordinate system go along? How should they look like? So maybe as a as a as a side thought. Ah, okay. So we have already uh, an answer in the chat that looks okay. 
So we start in the top left corner and x goes right, y goes down. And the first pixel as well, this is this is what we already fixed. So this convention here saying that well we will interpret the indices of a pixel as elements of R2, it already um, fixes all the rest of our coordinate system as stated in the chat. So normally if we draw coordinate axis, we start at the point 0, 0. Huh? So this is the center of our coordinate system. And now the first coordinate um, yeah, needs to get bigger once we go in the direction of the first coordinate axis. So this is our x coordinate. And also here we have one, we have a two here, and this one would be three. So the same for the y coordinate. The y coordinate also goes in this direction. So this is the second coordinate, and it's it works just the same. So this is important to remember because normally when we work with coordinate systems, they look a little bit different. So normally our xy coordinate system looks like this. So we have an x here and we have y here and then we have a function something like this. Yeah. So, but the coordinate system that we have here is actually just the same. So what you need to think about is take this normal coordinate system and rotate it by 90 degrees in this direction. And then you will get the coordinate system here that we use for images. Yeah, It's a little bit turned, but in the end we need this turn in order to make um, the indexing of matrix entries compatible um, with our usual notion uh, Cartesian coordinate system. So the last question is more or less of a technical nature. So is this coordinate system right-handed or left-handed? So this means um, if you have three coordinate axes and you take your right hand, can you then align uh, your the, your fingers with the coordinate axis? Yeah. And in this case, if we had um, if you look at at this system, it is a as a right-handed system. And if we turn it by 90 degrees, it stays a right-handed system. So in this case, the coordinate system is right-handed. But this is just a side fact, so it, uh, we won't need this fact here. So, so normally we work with a computer and I think we have all implicitly assumed that the images that we consider are discrete. So why are they discrete? We have here our omega is a discrete set. It just contains of, of a set of, uh, of points and each point uh, does not have an immediate neighbor. I can, always, um, I can always draw a little bit of an interval around each point and they won't touch each other. So we have a discrete discrete set here. And normally, the co so the images we have on a computer are always discrete images because the computer only can handle discrete images. In mathematics, however, we also use continuous images. And um, so this always, this already gives you the first answer to this question. So here we have an image that is continuous. And it asks you to specify a suitable domain and color space. So the answer is already given in the task here, but you can maybe just for completeness also state it in the chat or answer with your microphone. So F is an image that goes from omega to F. It's continuous. Y 
what about the domain and the color space. So compared to the images that we had before, we now don't have a, a set that is enumerated yeah, with numbers from one to three, but we have an interval. And this is already a good indicator, continuous image. And now instead of sets that enumerate just the numbers, we have intervals with infinitely many elements. And as correctly stated in the chat, we have, well, two intervals, two-dimensional image. And so there are two ways to write this down at least. So this is correct. All right, so this is the left-hand part. So we can basically just read this off. The same for the color space. Yeah, it goes from zero to one. So, and sometimes we just want to work with images like this. Our algorithms may um, be designed for continuous images and then it may be better to switch from a discrete image to a continuous one. And we can also do this with MATLAB or with Octave. So if we have an image here and we say, see it's an uint8 matrix. Yeah, if we address, so we, we looked here at the first entry uh, so the upper left corner is 166. So now we want to rescale this image or to convert it to a, in, in some sense, continuous image. It now takes double values from zero uh, to one. And we can use this, uh, we can, can use the following function that is called im to double. So let's, call this new image B and um, see if this command did something. Okay, now it tells us just it's a matrix, but now let's look at the first the upper left entry and we see that 266, uh, to, uh, sorry, that 166 was converted to this double number between zero and one. So we have already in our computer a way to switch from um, uint matrices to double entry matrices. And of course, we also have a way to switch back. So color space F, it's also zero one, just for completeness. And I think, um, yeah. So we can also draw a corresponding graph of this function. You can either think about if you have seen such a, such a function before. It looks like a parabola. If you look at it from one coordinate axis, if you add the second coordinate axis, you have again a parabola, and then you get something like a rotational uh, paraboloid. Um, yeah, so probably um, if you have seen something like this before, I've also generated a plot for you um, in order to make it more easier to understand how this graph looks like, I plotted it um, on a little bit larger domain, namely from minus one to one. But actually the part that we are interested in is just the part that is in here. Yeah, so also from this paraboloid, we only use this portion that is in, the, in this quadrant that I marked with red. So this would be the corresponding graph of this continuous image. So, and this is the last question for all the, uh, well, the mathematicians and those who, who weigh every word that we, that we use and ask if it's proper use of this word or not, because there is also a notion of continuity for functions. Yeah. So sometimes we say a function is continuous if it does not have any bumps or jumps. It does not really 
work with the notion of continuous image that we use because um, what we saw here is well the continuity depends only on how we how we choose our domain so maybe do you have an example for a function that is not continuous but still could could work as a continuous image So if you would design an example for this, you would, in the easiest case, start off with a function that has a jump and see if you can interpret it as a continuous image. So one example that we could use would be uh, a step function, yeah, very good. A step function or indicator function also works. But let's use a step function. So a step function would, for example, uh, mapping from R to 0, 1, and it would map x to, um, to 1, if x is greater or equal than 0, and 0 else. So if x is smaller than 0. So a step function, if I make a sketch here, would look something like this. So here it is 0, and then starting from 0, it is 1. Yeah, it, is, it fulfills all the properties that we need. So we have here a continuous set. In some sense, yeah, infinitely many points that cannot be separated. And we map to something that we can also interpret very well as a color space F. Yeah. Okay. So we have two more exercises, two little exercises that are about interpolation. That are exercises 2.4a and b. And we will also look at them quickly in the last 10 minutes of this exercise session. So interpolation is, um, so now we have the bridge. We have continuous functions uh, and we have continuous images and we have seen discrete images in the, in the exercise before. And now we want to translate between these worlds. And there's a lot of text here, but um, in fact, I just want you to, um, to take a look at the at the sketch that I have here below, because um, if we are in a discrete setting and we have a discrete image U D, then this image is given just by some points. Yeah, if it's a one-dimensional image, then we have our coordinates x and we have the values of the image y. So, and we see that there are a lot of points here where we don't have any information about our image. Our image is just not defined there. So interpolation is a way of extending the domain of definition to, from a discrete set, in this case, to a continuous one. And what we need, or what we want to use there, are um, uh, basis splines or basis functions that are, in some sense, very similar to the uh, example that we just discussed of a step function, or in this case as an indicator function. It is a function that just has a jump at zero, and is uh, it has a, a jump at minus 0 0.5, is one here in a neighborhood of zero, and it's zero else. So this is a function phi x. It lives at zero, and it extends to the left, and it also extends to the right. So now what we want to do is we want to move the support of this function. And we call this action of motion phi to the j. So what we have here in this notation is a function 
phi 0 of x, meaning we have this jump or this bump at position 0. So if we now move it, then phi 1 um, uh, is centered at 1. Yeah, and then we can just draw phi 1 here, namely it's it's centered at this position and it goes one half uh, to the left and also one half to the right here. So what we have here is just the function phi 1. So does this make sense so far? In theory, it's a convolution of phi with the indicator interpreted as Dirac's. Mm, I will need to think about this question, but um, so we will also see convolution later in this lecture and also in the exercises. So maybe we can um, we can keep this in mind if we can also see this as a convolution. Yeah, of course, if you want to implement something at the computer, then it's always good to think about operations like this. Um, but uh, so it's not the Dirac function itself because it's not, not just a jump at zero, but it's, um, yeah. So in the end, it's like a, like a jump that has also been shifted a little bit to the left and to the right, and it has a wider support than just a, just a jump here. So, but, um, and we can now, well, do this, this type of, uh, we use these functions also here. Yeah, so we can also extend here to the left and to the right with phi 2, with phi 3. We can do this. And we always need to multiply this function also by the value or the height of the jump. So here we have a jump height of 1. Here we have a jump height of 5. So we need 5 times this function. Here we have a jump of height 3. And uh, in the end, what we can now do is we can now write the continuous version as a linear combination of these basis functions. And this is what I'm going to write down now. So what we just did here mathematically was we um, say that the continuous image u of x is given as a sum from, uh, let's say, k equals 1, so we start at 1, we end at 5, yeah? we use the spline functions phi, ah, let's maybe call them j, like in the, in the exercise text, use the spline functions phi j, and then we also need to multiply them with the height of the jump. And the height of the jump is given via the value of the discrete image at position j. Yeah, so the discrete image given here on the left hand side, the height of the jump, this is just the coordinate here on the left hand side that we read off and we need to multiply our, our spline function with this value and what we get is a function that is defined basically on R, yeah? everything that we want. We can plug every number inside phi of x. Yeah? This works for every real number. So this is the functions that we use for nearest neighbor interpolation. And we also have um, another way to interpolate between functions, which is with bilinear splines. Yeah, so we have other functions that are our um, linear spline functions. And um, we can also take a look at those functions and they look like this. So a little bit short on time, therefore I will just sketch this function, but you should have seen it before. This is a very simple 
um, bump function. And it's not, not as a discontinuous bump like this one, but b of x is a function that looks like this. So it's um, at x equals 1, it is 1. And if x is 1 or minus 1, it equals 0. So this function looks like this. Uh, sometimes it's also called a head function because it looks like a triangular head, what we have here. So this is bx. And we can now do the same as we did before with our uh, nearest neighbor interpolants, or these, these functions here, with the new functions bi. So we can say that... Um, we can say we have a function bi of x that is nothing else than a shifted version of b of x with i. Or let's also ca call it j here. Yeah, so if I move this head with j to the right position and I scale it against uh, with, the, with the height of the image or the image value, I also get another way to interpolate um, these functions. And um, the idea is that this, this also tr uh, can be done very nicely in two dimensions. Maybe before we do this, I also add these linear spline functions to our sketch. So if I once again would use this formula, then I would now maybe draw in which color? Let's maybe use orange. Yeah, I would have a head here. I would have another head here. Uh, ah, no, the heads are a little bit wider. Sorry. So this would be the first head. This would be the second head. And you see that now we have an overlap. So in the in the sum, we will always have something that looks like the following. So we go here without any uh, distortion. And then in this part, we have a, an overlap. And it goes on like this. Yeah, so the, the principle stays the same. We use these functions. And we, um, yeah, we just multiply them with the, with the right height. So this can also be uh, very nicely done in higher dimensions, in particular in two dimensions. This is where we want to use it. So the formula stays the same. So let's, for last thing for today, take a look at this formula here. So I hope you have now a good um, impression of what this formula does. Namely, it starts out with an image that is discrete, uij, and then we use a two-dimensional basis spline. So, and how does this one need to look like? So, maybe I give you the formula here. It's actually part of the exercise to find this one. But, um, so, bij of xj should, nothing el should be nothing else like um, uh, bi of x times bj of uh, y. So, sorry, there should be a y here. So, it's just a product of the one-dimensional splines. And with this, we can use the same formula here. 